Hey everybody, John Foss, Minneapolis, Minnesota, talking with Mike Rowe about his show, Returning to Favor, which is in season three on Facebook Watch. Mike, tell us about the show. Well, Returning to Favor, essentially, uh, is one of those shows that lives up to its title. We find people who are deserving of attention. We find those people because other people go to my Facebook page and nominate them. We look at the nominations, I send them over to the production company, and we try and figure out what we can do for this person that would make them laugh, cry, and otherwise scream in unmitigated delight. Uh, then we show up to their town and freak them out. Well, I've only seen one episode so far. The episode was called Coach of the Year. Great episode, definitely a tearjerker. Are all of the episodes like that, or is every episode gonna pull at your heartstring? Yeah, I mean, it will always tug at your heartstrings, but my approach to this kind of television or this kind of content is not to rely on the whole, you know, move that bus moment like you saw in Extreme Home Makeover. This is, this is a much more honest look at the making of a feel-good show. And it really happened because, I don't know about you, but my news feed can get kind of ugly these days. You know, cable news is sort of a mess. The country's a tad divided. And so I wanted to do a show that just reminded people that there were, in their own communities, people that were really worth celebrating. It was a lot like Dirty Jobs in that regard, but on returning the favor, uh, we're just looking for bloody do-gooders, you know? And uh, Billy uh, up there, the, the one you're talking about, Coach of the Year, this guy opened up a modest size room in a church basement filled with used sporting equipment because a lot of kids in St. Louis who want to play sports just simply can't afford the gear. And people started donating this equipment that they had that was gently used. Got completely out of control. He ran out of space, so we went in, gave him a base, bought him a bunch of gear, took him to a Cardinals game one night, let him throw out the first pitch, made him laugh, made him cry, and then, like always, went to the next town to do it again. One thing about the show that really made me think twice about the future of TV is that we're talking Facebook here, social media, but this is high production value. This is high production TV that you guys are making and well, the future of TV is definitely, it's definitely shifting. Well, this is what's, this is where we're headed. You know, I mean, everybody has seen huge success online with janky little handheld cell phone videos. I get that. And of course, we've all seen shows like Planet Earth on television that are just so big and so beautiful. Somewhere in between is a mix of really great looking content with the kind of accessibility that you're talking about. And that's, that's what's happening. Our, our very first episode back in season one got 30, 37, 38 million views. Wow. Now, you know, in the old days, if three, four million people watched Dirty Jobs, they sent champagne and we had a parade. We had 30 million views on a show around the world right now. So it's a, it's a totally new way to think about not just how to reach an audience, but how to uh, engage with your fans. All the ideas for returning the favor come from the people who watch the show. So that's the thing that was most important to me. If you're going to be authentic and if you're going to be transparent, let the viewers produce your content. Give it away. And, uh, and they'll be engaged and they'll watch and that's what's happening. A common theme with your work is that it's very pro-America, very pro-hard work, pro-capitalism, which is very unique coming from Hollywood. Tell us sure. about that aspect of your life, of your perspective. Where does that come from? Well, I mean, for me personally, I, I grew up next to a guy who happened to be my grandfather who could build a house without a blueprint. He only went to the seventh grade, but he, his work ethic uh, was extraordinary and his skill was amazing. And unfortunately today, people like that are largely invisible. So to the extent I've been able to, I've, I've tried to point the cameras that follow me around toward those kinds of people and tell their stories. The trick, John, is to do it uh, in an honest way. So that means no take two. We don't do take two. Um, not on dirty jobs, not on returning the favor. Uh, we get it wrong a lot, but we always have a documentary camera rolling. So when I go into the edit to try and figure out what's the most honest way to tell this story, we show you the warts and all, the truth of making the production and the fun of getting it right and sometimes getting it wrong. But in the end, it's just an honest attempt to celebrate something universal, you know, whether it's work or whether it's decency or kindness, whatever it is, 
I have a feeling that the country, the country will do well to see something that is fundamentally uniting and not dividing. That's, that's really what we're trying to do with the show. You are one of the few celebrities I, that I can think of that talks about politics that is still liked by the left and the right. Uh, you're definitely a champion of the conservative base. They seem to love you for the values that you believe in. Do you get any flack living in San Francisco and working in LA from people on the left about about the things that you speak out about? Sometimes. I mean, the truth is, I, I kind of stay out of the fray by and large. The only time I get really pulled into it is around my foundation. And Microworks is really focused on scholarships for trade schools. So, I mean, everything's politicized today, but if you're going to weigh in uh, to the public conversation and you're going to talk about education and work, then you know, you are going to step on some toes because people have strong opinions about both of those things. For my part, I try to, to stay not necessarily in the middle because I kind of think that's mealy-mouthed, but I, I, I try and look for a common, sensical uh, piece of real estate, and then, I, and then I try and occupy it. For instance, we're $1.5 trillion in the hole on student loans right now as we speak and we have seven million jobs that are available that really by and large don't require a four-year degree they they require training but we're still lending money we don't have to kids who aren't going to be able to pay it back to train them for jobs that don't really exist anymore so that that's crazy but it, it's not necessarily a left or a right thing it's just it's what's happening in our country right now so that's a long way of saying, I'm not looking for trouble, but I'll step back and I'll say, hey, opportunity's not dead. And if you're telling me it is, I'll push back. And on returning the favor, you know, it's not a theme that I thought we would find, but we, but we see it in almost every show. It just did a story about a guy who came out of retirement to teach shop class for free in a high school because he was so convinced that kids needed to be exposed to those kinds of opportunities. That's a guy who I want to return a favor to, and so he did. Because of what you do, you seem to be very in touch with what Americans are feeling, thinking, saying out there uh, throughout the country. And in 2016, you predicted that Donald Trump would win the presidency. Mm -hmm. Do you have any predictions for 2020? Oh, man. No, I don't. Um, and look, I got lucky uh, in 2016. So people were asking me directly to weigh in, and I... I had an opinion and I shared it and the Sunday after the election I remember I was on Meet the Press because everything I wrote happened and um, I don't, I, I'm not taking any credit for it. To me it was obvious because I was spending a lot of time in, in Minnesota. I was spending a lot of time in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and, and Iowa and I was just hearing the same things over and over. It wasn't necessarily a, a pro-Trump message, it was more of a we got to do something. We have to, we have to start thinking differently about the definition of a good job. You know, that's what I was hearing over and over again. And that's what I think is still for sale. So looking forward, whoever can say the thing that engages the most people and feels the most authentic is going to win. Authenticity is still for sale, whether you're making a show for Facebook or trying to run the free world. Okay, so last question. You also have a very popular podcast. Tell us about that. The way I heard it was my attempt to uh, pay homage to Paul Harvey, who did a terrific, uh, terrific series for years called The Rest of the Story. So I write these six-minute mysteries, usually when I'm on a plane, and I record one a week. And it's a, it's a biography, sort of turned inside out. It's a fun way to learn about things that interest me and I try and make them fun. And uh, yeah, I, I just did it as a kick a couple of years ago, started posting them. And they just told me this morning it's the, uh, it's the number one short form podcast in the world. So I got that going for me, which is nice. Okay, well, Mike Rowe, thank you so much for being with us. And Twin Cities, check out Returning the Favor. It's in season three right now. You can check out episodes at facebook.com slash returning the favor. New episodes are posted Tuesdays at 11 p.m. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, John.